The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to one of the most enduring of all modern comic book writers, Stephen Grant. Best known today for creating Two Guns, which was made into a feature film in 2013 starring Denzel Washington and Mark Wahlberg, he's also the man behind memorable runs on The Punisher and Avengers at Marvel, Howard Chaykin's American Flag, and one of my favorites, X at Dark Horse. Next up is a crime miniseries for Legendary called Cops for Criminals and a revival of his 90s series Enemy for Dark Horse. Stick around. It's going to get grim and gritty around here soon enough. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is the Mr. Media Interview, brought to you today by Amazon.com. When you visit MrMedia.com and click on any of the links to purchase books, music, movies, gift certificates, or anything else through our Amazon link, you support this free video podcast. Whenever you need something else from Amazon, please consider returning to MrMedia.com to order it. It doesn't cost you any extra, and we sure appreciate the support. And don't forget, MrMedia.com has more than 1,200 celebrity audio and video interviews archived on the site. That's hundreds upon hundreds of hours free entertainment. Subscribe for free on MrMedia.com, and you'll instantly get an email every time a new interview is posted. You can also watch and subscribe to the show on YouTube, Vimeo, Dailymotion, The Realm Network, and Frequency.com. And if you prefer to just listen, Mr. Media is also available for free on iTunes, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Blueberry, TuneIn, Blog Talk Radio, Podfeed.net, and Player FM. You can subscribe to any of those services and never miss another episode. Finally, you can interact with Mr. Media interviews on all kinds of social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and more. Friend or follow us, we'll friend or follow you back. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience full of angry anti-heroes whose only available weapons are their fists, their wits, and barrels of ink in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. What I knew about comic book writer Stephen Grant before inviting him to be a guest could be summed up pretty quickly. He wrote a run of X for Dark Horse Comics when the publisher briefly flirted with creating a superhero universe of its own that included Ghost and Barb Wire under the world's best comics imprint. It was always the first comic I read the week it was published, and in a sea of spandex and X-dub characters, his stood above the rest. Well, thank you for saying so. You're welcome. Well, of course, that, and he wrote an always provocative online column about comic books called Permanent Damage and, of course, Master of the Obvious, of course. But digging a little deeper, I discovered he was a member of the Madison, Wisconsin Comics Mafia, which is sort of like the Indiana University Journalism Mafia at many American newspapers, if you're into that sort of thing. Anyway, Grant's byline has appeared in a stunning number of venues, from Trouser Press and Jim Steranko's media scene to a comics biography of, get this, Pope John Paul II. He has written for most every comic book publisher you can name, including Marvel and DC, of course, but also First, Eclipse, Wildstorm, Chaos, and even Techno, whose books I always enjoyed and whose, whose, uh, whose stand at the mall was always fun to visit. These days, following the success of the 2013 feature film adaptation of his Two Guns series, the movie starred Denzel Washington and Mark Wahlberg, He's been following his heart on newer projects. This includes a Rook miniseries for Dark Horse, drawn by Paul Gulacy, a crime miniseries called Cops for Criminals for Legendary, a revival of Enemy at Dark Horse, and he's looking for a publisher to sign up a completed horror graphic novel that he and Phil Winslade created. Oh, and no, he is not secretly Moon Knight. (laughs) The timing of this interview (laughs) couldn't be better. The day before we recorded this show, actor John Bernthal was announced to be the actor stepping into the shoes of The Punisher in the upcoming second season of Daredevil on Netflix, which will be followed by a 13-episode Punisher miniseries. So how does that connect to Grant? 
Well, as the writer of an early 1990s Punisher miniseries from Marvel, he's widely cr- credited with giving the character new and enduring life. Actually, mid 1980s. Man, I didn't want to. I didn't want to know it was that long ago. All right, yeah. I stand corrected. We're both older than we want to know. Stephen Grant, welcome to Mr. Media. Hello, pleased to be here. Pleased to have you. 30 years, oh my God. You don't want to know that, do you? 30, let's see, it's more like 37 years at this point, isn't it? It's been, uh, 78 was when I started writing at Marvel. Right, but The Punisher? Oh, The Punisher, yeah, The Punisher is 86, I think, so yeah, just slightly under 30 years. All right. That's that's crazy, and so I, I mean, I, maybe I'm wrong to ask you about this, but you must have taken note of uh, John Bernthal being uh, cast. Well, yesterday I uh, went onto Facebook and suddenly had a flood of people wanting my opinion on it. Uh, I don't have any problem with John Bernthal; he looks right for the part. Um, I liked him on Walking Dead. Uh, I don't know that I'll see him as the Punisher. I don't really pay that much attention to other people's Punisher stuff. So. All right. I, I, I have kind of a view of the character that no one else – I mean, it sounds egotistical and it's not meant to be. It's just I have a particular view of the character and I'm not really that interested in what other people do with him. So. Uh, has, your, has your view evolved over time or is it still you know, where no, you're starting with? No, it's pretty much the same. It's pretty much what I started with. Oh, yeah. Interesting. It evolved, in, uh, it evolved from the very starting point from – what Mike, Zach, and I ended up doing in the graphic novel Return to Big Nothing, which is a 1989 graphic novel that we did at Epic, is what I think The Punisher should be. So that's what it evolved into, and that's pretty much where it stayed ever since, which is fitting because that's part of what I view, how I view the character, is that he's incapable of growth. <laughs> I think that, I think you I think you nailed it there. I I, I don't think you could describe any other character as simply and elegantly incapable of growth. He, he is what he is. He's dead. He's 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 almost literally a walking dead man, except he's <laughs> not dead. So, but emotionally, he's completely dead. So he's incapable. I don't see him. I mean, that's part of the problem uh, other people have with the character is trying to bring depth to him and. The problem of writing the characters, you've got to figure out interesting ways to write a character who essentially has no depth. So, and that throws most people because it's not how they're taught to to approach character. So, have there been other, other writers who've handled Punisher that you've liked? I don't know. You haven't read it. Read it since I wrote it. Really? So, All right. Yeah, I, I don't think I've maybe guest shots here and there, but I haven't read any regular Punisher books since I wrote it outside of what I had to when I was back writing the character briefly in the mid-90s. Did you ever see the Punisher movie? I saw the second one, the one with Thomas Jane in it, but, um, which I, I liked Thomas Jane in it, and I thought the movie just didn't hang together. I thought it was... I, I thought... I wished he had been in a really good movie, because hmm. I thought he was really good as the Punisher. Interesting, interesting. But Bernthal seems to look like I imagine the Punisher to look. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's got a good look for it. Kind of broken nose look, and the, you know, just it kind of like um, who's the character? Uh, the goon, goon. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that. Um, yeah. Oh, character. And I just out of curiosity, uh, and we'll, uh, we won't linger on this much longer. But have you watched any of Netflix's uh, Daredevil series? I haven't had a chance yet. It's just a matter of finding time. I, I just barely caught up with The Flash like two days ago. Oh, so. I like that too. But Daredevil, I was very surprised. I, completely surprised. I expected to hate it. But it, it. I sat with my wife who knows nothing about the character whatsoever. And we sat with it and it was just incredibly compelling. And I said to her, I said, you're not going to believe this, but this is, if, if, this is the way as a kid I believe that the, the Daredevil would be. It's dark. It's moody. It's just uh, the character. You know, he's very human, and yet he's a little beyond. And so, for them to be doing the Punisher in the same mode, I'm actually more hopeful than I was for the movie. Well, I, you know, I'm. I may. I mean, I'm not saying it won't be good. It'll probably be good. I just don't know if I'll ever watch it. <laughs> Fair enough. And uh, you know, so you mentioned that you know you haven't kept up with the Punisher after, I mean, it's been 30 years, which is fine. You're not going to, I don't expect you to start following it now. But I mean, do you, 
do you build some form of attachment to these characters when you work on them um, that stays? With um, you? Yes and no. Uh, it doesn't really. Uh, one thing I've learned over the years is it doesn't really pay to be to maintain strong attachments to characters uh, because they'll just screw them over for you. <laughs> um, there, yeah, I mean, there are characters I've. Well, you know, the characters I liked as a kid were, were uh, Spider-Man and Green Lantern. And, you know, I wrote quite a bit of Spider-Man stuff over the years. Um, Green Lantern I've written less, but uh, I would, you know, part of me would still love to write Green Lantern if I could write, do whatever I wanted with it and not have to follow uh, whatever rules they've set up. But, but you know, I still have mild emotional bonds from my childhood to those characters. As far as professionally, there are like mostly Marvel characters I still have some, you know, some love for. I'd, I still like Hawkeye. Uh, Mockingbird, of course. I co-created Mockingbird, so she's always been a favorite of mine that I've never thought they've handled properly. Although I, that, her I did watch on the S.H.I.E.L.D. thing, and that's something else I'm way behind on. But uh, what I've seen of what they've done with her on the on S.H.I.E.L.D. I've liked. Um, Same here. But, you know, by and large, it, it pays more to get attached to your own characters, to, to uh, the characters you own, rather than the characters somebody else owns. So <laughs> you kind of learn not to do that after a while. I, I had not realized that you had created Mockingbird, and... I, I got it. so now I've got to ask, which I, I think she, the, the uh, Adrian uh, Padalecki, I guess is Padalecki. Uh, Padalecki. Uh, Padalecki. Gra- she's gorgeous, first of all, but to see her kick ass is. Oh, I think she works great in the part. It's amazing. I saw her Wonder Woman pilot, and I think she's much much better as Mockingbird. Oh yeah. <laughs> Do you now if there was talk just a, a matter of a month ago about uh, them breaking her out into a, a spinoff, which I guess is not happening at the moment, but. There's still talk of it, whether it happens or not. Um, who knows? But yeah, there's still talk of it. But but I just it, my daughter told me yesterday that the rumor going around online, and of course we always know how trustworthy those are, is that no one wants her to leave the show because she and her boyfriend are the only interested parts of it. So maybe I don't know. But uh, they I, I mean, I, from an egotistical point of view, I like that explanation. But uh, I, I think whether that's that true or not, I couldn't say. I th- well, from what I read, that was, I mean, right up to Robert Iger, the decision was, yeah, you know, people are saying, why take the two most interesting characters off the show? Leave them there at least for a little while longer and build some more. Right. Do you, I mean, I know this is a very touchy subject for a lot of creators, but do you, I mean, if do you see anything off of that character being in TV or would you? Well, I got a nice credit for it on the show. Uh, my my name runs on the back of every episode now, so that's good egotistically. As far as money goes, not so far, but uh, I figured I'd leave that discussion for when they spin her off in her own show. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so you-, uh, you know, I, I'd have to go back and look at specific, you know, it, what goes on with the contracts at Marvel and Disney and all that varies from moment to moment. And uh, it's not quite the situation that, that they recently had at DC, which from as far as I know is they're working on correcting now. But, uh, you know, the recent Jerry Conway right. is not at DC. But um, at this point, it's maybe, maybe not. So we'll see. <laughs> yeah. I- the benefit for you I, and, and, and guys and women, too, in, in your position, having worked in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s when there was no Internet and if you were being screwed, nobody knew about it, uh, you know, is, is that this, whatever the contracts were at the time, things are different now. They're making millions. Right. Well, that, that's true, but the contracts still, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean the contracts are void. So, you know. Well, um, true. I, I, don't, I don't really see fans mounting a – a uh, uh, boycott Mockingbird and Shield campaign on my behalf. It's, you know, so um, you know, and, and I, I, and I'm not asking them to believe me. No, <laughs> so, I, I understand. Uh, I think, uh, it, it, but the, I guess the thing is, they don't really have to with with the the way the internet and and media works now. Uh, if if they spun them off. And word got out that you know you were you were you were credited but not paid. 
uh, I would think that the studios would really have no option but to find some way to compensate you at least a little to shut people up and you know to make you go away happy. Well, if they wanted to, sure. I mean, <laughs> Disney, Disney is a big, big corporation with you know lots of disposable income, so it's possible. I mean, it's it's not like I would ever threaten them or or sue them or anything over it. So. It's, you know, I mean, my, my view of lawsuits is that they generally cost more money than they're worth. So, <laughs> But, you know, on the other hand, if Disney wants to, if Disney and Marvel want to uh, pay me to go away, I'm more than happy to discuss it. Or so, maybe pay you as a consultant or... You either know. way, yeah. either way. I mean, I could, I could do with that. Yeah, okay. So, right. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm open to, to all discussions, so... But, you know, I don't know if anything would ever come of it anyway. So, well, so um, Mockingbird fits into this next thing I wanted to ask you about. I mean, you've – a lot of your work, a lot of your reputation is built on uh, writing these very strong, silent types who, uh, you know, shoot first uh, and ask questions or apologize later. Uh, Mockingbird, certainly part of that group, but X and American Flag, you know, Flag and uh, uh, Punisher, uh, you know, a whole bunch of these – uh, we were talked a little bit about it before the show started. Why do you think that's uh, stuck to you? Why do you think that you're that guy? Um, a long time ago, I found I had a fondness for writing characters who don't feel compelled to explain themselves. <laughs> and I think that's led into it a lot. Um, I, I hate it when, when comics characters sit there and, and any characters, whether comics or any other medium, I hate it when they sit there and blah, 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 about I'm going to do this and that and that and that. I just, you know, wanted to write characters who go ahead and do it and don't bother, you know, and don't feel compelled to uh, justify themselves afterwards. You know, they, they, they already feel justified. They don't care what other people think of them. So I think, I think that's, uh, I'm just kind of drawn to writing that type. In some ways, in some ways, it's laziness because they're really a lot easier to write than characters who have to uh, sit there explaining themselves to everybody and and trying to get the bat, you know, trying to get uh, trying to be loved. Basically, I mean, I, I can't imagine a character doing that who's doing that kind of thing who's out to be loved is what it amounts to. Uh, and that's that's really at the bottom of it. It's it's not so much that I I want to write tough guys as I just don't want to have to have them explaining themselves all the time. <laughs> Long as the reader understands what they're doing, I don't care whether the other characters do. Mm. Well, I mean, what I liked always, I think one of the things I really liked about X was he explained nothing. I mean, you you would almost have to read it from month to month to start gaining some insight as to what. Well, I, that, that, was kind of the whole, that was kind of the whole point of X. Yeah. I mean, he did explain the basic rules. He, I mean, X had his like three or four basic rules of behavior and explained them, and was more than happy to to set out the um, the parameters of of what's acceptable and not acceptable, and then follow through on it. So that you, I mean, the thing with you, if you got one strike, it was a warning. If you got two strikes, that's it. You were, you know, basically two strikes and you're out. And that was the X, you know, the one strike is one. That's the X and you get the X and you're dead. And he gives you fair warning. He's coming for you. I mean, he, you get the X generally before you get the bullet. Um, but as far as explaining who he is and what he's after, it was all self-evident to him. Why would he bother explaining it? <laughs> Well, it's his city. He runs it. Period. So, and the uh, uh, tell me if you would, and and uh, folks who are not interested in this, go ahead and tune out for a few minutes. But I gotta ask. I loved, I loved that series when it was, you know, they were uh, Dark Horse was trying to do its own universe and it had these other characters and try to bring them all together. Um, did you go into that? And I know you didn't create uh, X. You don't own <laughs> X, um, right. but. Did you go? Did you go into that at the time, thinking, "Hey, this this might be a, an ongoing kind of thing"? I'm in, I'm in at the beginning. Was it seen? Did you see it as something that was going to go on for a long time, or did you anticipate this being Dark Horse? It was going to be a short, you know. Well, no. I mean, Dark Horse had intended to keep it going for as long as they could. Um, that was kind of the whole point to their superhero universe. The problem that Dark Horse had is that they took way too long to develop it, and by the time they had developed it. Because uh, Dark Horse actually started developing what became comics, 
comics were Greatest World, and then what are they? Dark Horse Heroes, they changed it to later because um, they were trying to rebrand it and get some excitement that way. But they actually started developing that whole thing in-house like three years before that. So it was like 86, 87. It was about the time Marvel came out with their new universe. You know? And it, had they gotten it out within a year, it probably would have been a huge sensation. The problem is that they got it out like a year and a half after everybody else released their new universes. And there's only so much that can be done with it. You know, at that point, you, you can't really at a point where everybody is doing the same thing. You can't come out and say, OK, we've got something really special here, because even if you do, they you're going to have a hard time selling it to a saturated market. So that was their problem with that. And um, I mean, X lasted longer than most of the Dark Horse, you know, uh, uh, Dark Horse Heroes books, but. I mean, it lasted a couple of years. That was pretty good for that point in time because that was right when things were starting to slide uh-huh. in general for the comics market. And um, they could have had it going for, they could have kept it going for a long time had they launched earlier. But. I mean, I think I think what I thought at the time was I was surprised that they tried a universe and knowing, I mean, they've really made their money over the years on on unconnected comics things oh, yeah. mini series or you know they they had a set run and so i mean it was interesting to see and i thought a lot of the comics were quite good uh, i don't care so much for barbed wire but ghost and and x and uh, i'm probably there's other titles rattling around in my head i would think of uh, i wasn't terribly surprised when it kind of you know reached the reached its end and and they moved on from it but you know Okay, so enough about X. I know there's people who want to know about other things. Um, by the way, we were talking a minute ago about uh, uh, characters not explaining themselves and how you like that, you know, whether it's Punisher or, or Mockingbird, whatever, uh, X. But you also pointed out that uh, growing up that one of your favorites was uh, Spider-Man, and you did work on Spider-Man a long time. Now, there's somebody who's constantly – we're constantly inside his head. How do you kind of balance the two, or is that – well, I mean, Spider-Man's a different case because I, I had a particular take on Spider-Man that I tried pulling off as much as possible, which is that Spider-Man and Peter Parker aren't really the same guy. Is that the reason? I mean, basically, Spider-Man is literally a mask for Peter Parker so he can go out and do these things because if he. I mean, Peter Parker would would shoot his pants if he did the things that he does as Spider-Man. I mean, because he's Peter Parker. You know, he's a nevishy nerd. He puts on a mask. He goes out and does these wonderful things. But but the um, the problem of the character is that he cannot take what he's doing seriously. He's congenitally incapable of taking what he's doing seriously, because if he takes it seriously, he'll give himself a heart attack. It's like if it's if it becomes um, actually seriously a matter of life or death to him, these battles with the with, you know, these superhero battles, then. He's going to be, you know, it's like he can't deal with it. And that's why he jokes through the whole thing. Uh He he has to joke. He's he obsessively jokes. Now, his problem is that all of his villains want to be taken seriously. (laughs) So that's where the main problem is between him and his enemies is that he won't take them seriously and that's all they desperately want so that's where the te- that's where the main tension and the comedic tension of the dialogue comes from uh so that was always my take on spider-man so he was he, he was fun to write when i could write him that way and it wasn't always possible to write him that way but but you have a three so you need a three barrel joke you need the joke spider-man starts with you need the villain straight man response to the joke. I mean, you have to kind of write Spider-Man as a vaudeville act. Yeah. And then you have the the um, left f- Spider-Man's left field retort to whatever the villain says. You know, and and this comes from reading the old Spider-Man. And you know, I th- I actually think maybe they didn't think it through. Maybe he didn't think it through all that. All that way, but I think that's how Stan wrote the character. Because if you read the or the the Lee Ditko issues of Spider Man, that's the rhythm of the dialogue. Is you have the the joke, the the straight man retort, and the, and the retort joke. So 
in that level, he was a really fun character. Right? I mean, I like writing characters that don't explain themselves. I don't have to do it all the time. <laughs> I, got it. I got it. And uh, Spider Man. I mean, you know, one of the one of the complaints about Superman after seventy five mm-hmm. years is that it's so hard to to create a situation that he can't get out of in some way. And we've well, seen unless you unless you strip him of his powers or something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And 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 Spider Man fifty sixty. What are we? Sixty almost sixty years in. Right. Uh, fifty, fifty-five, something like that. Um, is it the? Are there similar issues now? There's been so many stories told. There's we've been we've. Well, we've... It, I think it's hard coming up with new angles for Spider-Man, but in terms of the character, I mean, he is. Despite his powers, he is still a relatively. I mean, compared to Superman, certainly he's a relatively normal guy. He's he's certainly a lot more personally vulnerable than say Batman is. You're not really allowed to uh, to beat the hell out of Batman. I mean, once in a while they do it, but for the most part, you you know, if you did a story where you, Batman just gets the hell beat out of him, they wouldn't you know they wouldn't really be interested in buying that story. Um, Spider Man, you can accept. Being, I mean, the thing I liked about Spider-Man when I was a kid is, I think the, well, the first one that I read was like number nine, but then the next one that I saw was number seventeen, which is a great issue with the Return of the Green Goblin, where he runs out on the fight at the end. You never saw anybody doing that. I mean, I always thought of Spider-Man as a character who will run out on a fight if he's got a good reason to, and that goes completely against the common motif for superheroes which is their guys who go in there and they you know they're there they're intrepid they're always there they won't run away from a battle they won't do they you know basically they won't be smart they won't handle things smartly um i don't like writing characters who who aren't willing to take the easy way out basically i mean they're, they're the smart way out well i shouldn't say the easy way out but the smart way out if you're up against a guy who's Fifth, you know, who's a hundred times stronger than you are and invulnerable. Going at him, going at him head on is generally not a really bright idea. Mm. So characters who do that, well, it's like I'll tell you. Um, back in the old Marvel days, um, I had to crash with Roger Stern when I moved to New York City because I couldn't find an apartment, and I was there. I was living on his couch for several months, and he and John Byrne would talk on the phone all the time. And he and John got into some conversation, which these conversations always amused me about um, what superhero would you be if you could be any superhero? <laughs> and I, forget who, I forget who Roger said. I think Captain America. <laughs> I think Captain America. And um, and he said John would be Iron Man. Now, Iron Man always bored the hell out of me. So I thought, well, Iron Man, why would he be Iron Man? And Roger said, well, because he... Because, you know, he's a guy who puts on armor with all kinds of weapons in it and goes out to fight people. He doesn't go out like in a skin tight costume with just fists and fight people. He's a guy who, like, you know, goes out ready for war. And I thought about this for a minute. And I said, well, in that case, I'd be Hawkeye, which Roger was just like, Hawkeye? What are you talking about? I said, well, Hawkeye doesn't have to get within 75 yards of anybody. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and at that point, I, I thinking at that point, well, Hawkeye and Hawkeye always one of, was one of my favorite characters, mainly because archery was the only sport I could do as a kid. So, <laughs> but that, I, at that moment, I gained a fondness for Hawkeye. Uh, when in answering that question, I thought, yeah, I'd be Hawkeye, you know. So, but that, that's kind of my general attitude towards superheroes, though. So let me ask you a question. So, uh, what would Twelve-year-old uh, Stephen Grant in I'm think 1965, uh, right? right? What would what would he think? Would he be would he be thrilled to to know that in 2015, half a century later, you would be you would be sitting and having a professional conversation about superhero powers and who you'd want to be if you could be one of them? Would that would that, well, would that I, make I, you I, very happy? I think- I think 12-year-old me would be thrilled about that. I think 17-year-old me would be a little upset. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> the comic books have been pretty good to you over time. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, I've done great with comic books. Uh, you know, 
took more tenacity than anything, I think. But uh, I don't know if I have that much talent, but I certainly have had tenacity. <laughs> uh, there, there might be a little smidge of talent involved there. You know, I I don't want to I don't want to pump you That's up too other much. Other people but... to say. You know. <laughs> I I love that um uh, I I'm I'm about 10 years uh, let me think uh, maybe about 10 years younger than you and I love that I can sit here talking to you and part of my living involves being able to still at this age talk about comics uh, well I like not having to be able, I unite I like not having to uh have a job where I have to shave so you know in that regard it's been great Oh, see, you could. I, I, I thought maybe you had. I shaved for the interview, and nobody can even see me. But uh, okay, well, I you can looking, tell. It's been a couple of days since I shaved, but you know, yeah, the, the, I, my my beard doesn't grow all that quickly, and it comes out white anyway. So in certain light, it's invisible. So I was going to say the good news is is that surface video of yours is a little forgiving on the beard. I wouldn't have guessed that you hadn't shaved. <laughs> so there. Um, okay, one more thing about the Punisher before we move on from all this. Sure. Um, I, I was thinking about it, and you are actually the uh, third guy I've had on the show who has written for The Punisher in one way or another. Um, Chuck Dixon, who was on several years ago, and I'm actually going to interview again this, this weekend, uh, is written for Punisher. And the third guy, if you will accept him into this group, is Batten Lash, who wrote Archie meets That's right. The he Punisher. did write that. Right. Right. Um, I so I have I have to ask. I know you said before you, you you hadn't read any of the Punisher comics. Did you happen to read Archie meets the Punisher? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> okay, I had to ask. I know Batten, but absolutely not. Oh, okay, <laughs> it was. I, I I saw like one page from it on a website someplace, and he's going. All I know about it is that he's hunting down some guy who's got like hatch marks in his hair, and I that was enough for me. So. <laughs> All I needed to hear was the Punisher in Riverdale, and I was there. I, yeah. I, I still, ha- you know, God, I I have, that has the opposite effect on me. Yeah. I, I don't have a lot of my comics from when I was a teen and in college, but that one is still in in a box somewhere in the in the garage. I know that. Uh, so anyway, mind you, I don't hold it against anyone if they <laughs> liked it. That's fine. But you know, as far as me, I got I got other things to do. <laughs> I, I completely understand. I completely understand. All right, so let's uh, let's move on to things more recent. Uh, let's talk okay. about two guns. Um, it, it's been you know we've had the benefit of some time. It's been about two years since the movie was done and came out. Uh, does it, did it hold up for you? Were you were you happy with it? Oh no, I love the movie. Actually, I think they have a better ending than I had. Yeah. Well, um, that the movie doesn't follow the comic exactly, but it it replicates everything that I think is important about the comic. So, you know, so in that regard, it's fine. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I enjoyed watching the movie a lot. I, I thought they handled it really well. And, and spiritually, it's my book. So, I mean, my, I, I could see my fingerprints all over it in that regard. So I, I know I'm, I'm not one of these guys who sees the movie adaptation of their comic and goes, Oh, they didn't get that right. Well, I think for the most part, they pretty much got everything right. Uh, so, yeah, no, I love the film. I still watch it. I have a copy right here if you want me to show it to you. Uh, sure. Let's see. Can we get this on screen? See? Oh, ah. yeah. There it is. See? <laughs> there it is. Yeah, just for those, it's still available. So just uh, we'll, price we'll, going down on it or anything. We'll, uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll put a link up to it uh, on, the, yeah. on the page. Um, I was, so I was going to ask you if um, – if there was anything, uh, you sort of answered it. If, if there was anything that the screenwriters added to the foundation that you provided that you liked, and it sounds like yeah, you were happy with the ending of all things. I thought the ending was great. I, I mean, it was a it was a good. Um, it it monkeys with with the basic premise of my story a little, but that's fine because I expected them to see. See the when I wrote Two Guns, I conceived it as an anti-buddy picture. And, and it stays an anti-buddy picture through the whole thing. Now, for their purposes, they kind of twisted that at the end, but I don't really have a problem with that because I did think it was a really good ending. Um, so that, that's that's like the one place that – but even at the end, you don't really necessarily get the feeling that they're – it's more like a marriage of convenience than a friendship. you know. <laughs> so so I, I don't really have a problem with, with that at all. Uh, and I thought it was a good – Good way to bring it back to the beginning. Interesting. And so uh, I know what people want to know is what's the status of sequel to either film or comic? 
You, well, I mean, Three Guns came out last year from from, and I think is it's either about to be or is just being released from Boom as a trade paperback, and um, and as far as the movie, you're, I guess as good as mine. So you know, it's it's the the fine art of uh, Hollywood uh, decision making and financing. You know, you've, you've got people, bean counters adding up things and checking people's schedules and whatever and figuring out if it's worth doing for them, which who knows. And uh, eventually they, uh, they e- either they say yes or you just never hear. So mm. who knows? It could happen. It could. I mean, look how long it took them to get, uh, you know, kick-ass number two off the ground. You know, it's like, it's like they... Things come out of the, you know, just when you think, I mean, Mad Max, Mad Max, there hasn't been a Mad Max movie in 15 years, you know, or however long, it's 20 years, however long it's been, and suddenly there's a Mad Max movie, so, who knows, you know, and, don't know well, that's just the way Hollywood is. You know? Generally, when, when Hollywood options a, a, a property, like a Two Guns, there's, a, there's a, a, a fee that they pay up front. And then there's a fee that they pay when they go into production, and then there's a fee that they pay, I guess when it when it's actually produced and, and completed. I, I don't th- I I haven't had the experience. I, I, that's as far as no, I've gone. Gen- generally, is there's the you do the, you make the option. They give you a certain percentage of the option money up front, and then renew it. Uh, give you that much every option period, and that goes against the purchase price, which. The purchase is what when the film starts when the cameras start rolling you get the purchase price on it. Right, so. and and that's that's the length that's the extent of my personal experience with it. Right. As I I've had one property option, but in, in the case of doing like a sequel to that property, does the process start again? Ah, uh, yeah, it does. Um, the well, I, I'm yeah, it does. The it's usually built in. That process is usually built into the contract for the original movie. So, you know, whatever our process is. So you haven't. I guess where where I'm going is you haven't seen a, a check yet for an option for. No, no, movie. no, no. They they haven't. They haven't. Uh, direct. I mean, technically, they have an option on it. Period. Because they did the first one. Right. Um, I don't actually know whether they need to pay us anything up front to do a uh, I'd have to go look at the contract uh, it's been a long time since I read it at this point um, yeah I don't know whether they'd have to pay us option money up front because technically they already have it okay so, interesting I was just uh, curious they it's might have to I don't know but they haven't yet so. I would guess that they'd have to give you something to work on a, a sequel it's just my guess necessarily seems reasonable yeah, but not necessarily. I mean, like I say, they've already made the film. It's not like they have to option the property. They've already bought the property. That's the thing. Right. So it's just a matter of they have to – I think when they start the next film, they have to pay whatever the amount is that they agreed to pay to do a sequel. But I don't know that they have to option the sequel in advance. So I'd have to go look at I'd have to go look at the contract, which if you think about it, that actually does make sense because, like I say, they already bought the property. So, All right, word to Universal Studios from me. If you want to send him a check because you want to do a second movie, I think Mr. Grant will cash it. Uh, in general, if anyone wants to send me a check, I will cash it. You don't even have to tell me what it's for. And <laughs> checks that I have no idea what they're for. <laughs> I like that. All right. All right, well, let's move on to more, even more current projects. Uh, you are doing uh, the Rook miniseries with uh, Paul Gulacy, whose work I remember, gosh, when I was in high school. My goodness. Um, tell me about this. This is, this is uh, from the Warren character? Right, yeah, it's the uh, Warren character created by Bill DeBay. And uh, Bill DeBay's family, well, Bill DeBay got the rights to a number of his, you know, with all the Warren things. Uh, all the Warren properties going here and there in the uh, late 90s. Uh, you know, you may remember there were all kinds of lawsuits and things about them. Um, Bill Dubay ended up recovering the rights to a number of the characters he created for uh, for Warren, including the Rook. And uh, when Bill died, and Bill was actually starting to work on them, but then came down, I forget what cancer was it? Um 
he, he died a few couple of years after that, and it went to his uh, his nephew. The rights went to his nephew, who has been putting together a developing a package of um, things for the Rook, like like a uh, video game and trying to talking about movies and TV deals and things like that. But in the meantime, he uh, approached Paul to if see if he was wanted to draw a Rook miniseries. And Paul and I had been um, talking about working together for a long time. And Paul called me up and said, are you willing, you know, are you interested in writing this? And I thought, sure, why not? I'll, I'll work with, you know, ba- basically I like the character. I, th- I think it's an interesting character. But my main interest in it was really working with Paul. So, which we're, we're, we've sort of got a mild partnership going on at the moment. Uh, you know, I, so. I, I'm, I'm still back on. I didn't know that Bill Dubé had passed. I, had, uh, I interviewed him for my uh, Eisner uh, biography, gosh, it's over a decade ago. Uh, you know, it was sometime in the early 2000s, I think, maybe, maybe like you, you can look it up. I mean, it's, yeah, but he. I'm, well, I'm. Sorry to hear it, folks. I just didn't know. Um, and so you and Paul are working on a couple of things. What else? What else? Is there anything else you can tell well, us we, about? We have a, we have a, well, I can't really tell you about anything else. We have a creator-owned property that we're shopping around, um, looking for, you know, looking for the right deal. on it. And it's a little bizarre. Uh, all the things we're doing are a little bizarre. And then there's a small company out of Maryland, is it, that... Uh, that's talking to us about doing an eight pager for them and things like that. So, you know, we're open to discussion for, for various things. Um, but, you know, uh, ultimately we'd like to create several things. So, but right. now getting P, you know, getting people to pay for them is the hard part. <laughs> oh, you don't do it for the love. Oh, come on. Uh, you know, I grew up in the sixties <laughs> And there was a saying in the late '60s that they used to you used to be able to get a little button that you could wear on your which is which went love is like butter it's better with bread. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you were you were a Will Eisner hippie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, interesting. It was funny that uh, you. Uh, I guess there's. I mean, I know now there's no connection to Jim Warren, but literally yesterday I got a press release from Jim Warren. Uh, in the mail, yep. announcing that uh, he is putting uh, famous monsters and some of his other publications online for the first time. Oh yeah, yeah, they'll That's be available good. as Kindle Kindle eBooks. So I, I don't have much many excuses to talk about Jim Warren and Warren Publishing, but you know, That's just, pretty like, funny. that was about. like the one book I never read. I had I never had any interest in movie monsters, so it's always fun when you're you know dealing with comics people. Hey, what about this? You know, it's like, eh, Frankenstein. Who cares? <laughs> it's yeah. like, so I, you know, that that's always been kind of a blind spot of mine, especially when people want to do Universal movies, monster comics, which comes up periodically for some reason. It's like wrestling comics. People keep bringing up wrestling comics. And, <laughs> now, can't you, really do wrestling comics. Were you much of a fan of the the Warren, uh, uh, you know, creepy and eerie and? That kind of stuff. I was when Archie Goodwin was writing them in the early days. Mm-hmm. Um, the art largely turned me off on them when I was when I hit my teens, you know, because they brought you know. I mean, you suddenly go from Gray Morrow to Tony Tallarico. I'm sorry, there's that kind of a jump, you know. Yeah. Uh, so and also there, you know, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin, which was controlled by uh, independent distribution distributors which didn't distribute i was very strange i had to go to little towns out of town to get charlton or warren magazines uh tower comics would only show up in woolworths for some reason and they were not only did they only show up there but they were there for years they just sat there. (laughs) yes i remember that yeah i think i could go in in like 1972 and buy thunder agents number six you know uh so uh, distribution in in Madison, basically came down to Marvel, DC, and Archie, and uh, you know, like that Dell, um, ECG, things like that. But Warren magazines were pretty were difficult to come by, so it took work. So, and you know, for a number of those years, I wasn't really in a position where I could drive myself. So. <laughs> 
it was difficult to explain to my parents why I had to go to Sun Prairie. So. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's touch on before we have to wrap up. Let's touch on a couple of the other projects. Uh, tell me about uh, Cops for Criminals, which you're doing for uh, Legendary. Yeah. This. What the hell? Hold on one second. Sure. We won't um, eavesdrop. There we go. There we go. Okay. That's still that phone. So, co- um, Cops for Criminals. Cops for Criminals is a project for Legendary Comics. Um, Involving an FBI agent who gets framed for a crime he doesn't he didn't commit and sent to prison. And when he comes out of prison, the only job he can get is working for the mob okay. as a cop. And he's he's basically it postulates the mob at, in this particular city as a shadow government that really that is really. Basically, they've got their, they have found that, that in order to function, they need their own structures similar to, to um, the legitimate structures. And so they, so one of them brings in this guy to be a cop to like find people who are missing and basically do things you, you expect from a cop, crowd control, that kind of thing. Because you don't necessarily want to have hitmen doing this, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's um, you know, they, they, they have found that, that they need to modulate their approach some. And in the meantime, he's using this as a uh, as a way to track down who framed him, and it gets into fairly complicated era, social areas, and uh, and it's it's um, yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. And a guy named Pete Woods is drawing it. My next I, I forget off the top of my head what Pete is, what else Pete has done. Although I know he's done quite a bit of stuff, and something else you feel free to look up. Okay, but. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, so um, so yeah, I'm having. I actually, I'm finishing the uh, fifth issue, the final issue this week, and this is the one that, that gets violent. So it's been fairly non-violent so far. It's, this is the one that gets very violent. Right. See, I, I have a uh, I have a structure to my stu- a natural structure to my stories that I don't get to use all that much, but frequently I. Uh, when I when I'm writing crime stuff, this is the general structure of it: is that you take as many characters as you can as they will comfortably fit into the story and you kind of throw them into decaying orbits, uh, circling each, you know, kind of, they just decaying orbits that the paths cross in different ways until they're all down to a, uh, it basically everything's down to everybody in the same place at the same time. And they all start shooting and whoever, wa- whoever walks out at the end is the hero of the story. So, and if you read things like Badlands and Damned and other crime books I've done, uh, that's, pretty much the structure of the story and it took me a while to realize that it's kind of, it's not something i came up with intentionally it's something i recognized after the fact so uh that's kind of the structure of this but so the the last act is always the the most violent in, uh, in my books i find all right and one more project uh tell me about bringing enemy back at uh, dark horse oh um yeah uh let's see well Enemy was a thing I created in Dark Horse in 93, was it? Uh, must have been 1993 or 94. And it had a five-issue run that basically went nowhere. And then uh, out of the blue, although it did spawn a, briefly spawn a Fox TV show, oh. uh, it was optioned and, and made into a pilot that uh, David Goyer was behind, actually. this is, I think this is David Goyer's first production job, so they gave him that credit that he could build on. So I am uh, yes, I am partly responsible for David Goyer. I guess. Uh, <laughs> Excellent. And uh, keep that in your pocket. And my, my, you know, my, my reach extends everywhere, <laughs> like little spiders creeping through the darkness. Um, <laughs> and uh, and so that got made into a pilot, which I'm told was actually on the the schedule in I think '96 for about whenever 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 year it was that Millennium happened it was came down to that or millennium and it was actually on the uh, the fox schedule i'm told for a couple of weeks and then something in between happened and it wasn't so but uh anyway mike so mike richardson uh, called me out of the blue a few weeks uh, a few months ago at this point i'm kind of running behind on things and uh and said hey i want you to revive enemy and I said, oh okay fine so you know that's pretty much it but uh but he, he's a guy who um 
Well, Mike and I have a disagreement about this, about what he actually does. So I, so I keep it vague. But he's another guy who doesn't feel compelled to explain himself. But he, he, um, You're talking about Richardson or the? No, no, the character. <laughs> just Mike. Just Mike kidding. explains. Himself. Just kidding. Mike. Sorry, Mike. Um, but he's another. He's uh, basically drawn to his. He's drawn to his uh, targets by um, the ghosts of the of the people that they've killed. Hmm. So. At least that's the superficial gimmick, and the real gimmick is a little different. But uh, Mike and I have a little disagreement over whether it's the superficial gimmick is the real one, or the gimmick under the gimmick is the real one, which is that it's their guilt, their their subconscious guilt that's drawing him to them. Okay. So basically, people are begging him to make them pay for their crimes. So um, that one's a little complicated, but uh, maybe a little. But I don't so that that's that's my underlying uh, premise to the to the thing. But you can read it either way; it works perfectly well either way. Okay. And uh, sorry about my light; can keeps flickering out. I'm not sure why. That's but right. you're, uh, you're in a cheap gin joint somewhere, right? That's yeah, the, the fan nice overhead that seems precariously maybe. near your head. <laughs> so two more questions. We'll let you we'll let you get on with your life. Anyway, um, let me say it's a, it's a big action adventure piece. So okay. All right. Um, these are unrelated questions. I just want to warn you. Uh, who uh, who are the best comic book editors that you've worked with, and wh- how do you know that they've added to the process when everything is said and done? Oh, the best comic book editors don't add to the process. <laughs> Does it add to the process? I end up having the most trouble with. Um, no, that's not that's not really fair. Um, Basically, the, the best comic book editors are the ones who lay out the parameters ahead of time and then let you go. Because you, know, you give me the parameters, I'm perfectly willing to work within them. You keep shifting the, the guidelines. Uh, it gets kind of difficult after a while. Um, Bob Shrek, um, Archie Goodwin. Let me think. Uh, I know I'm, I, I hate answering questions like this because you're always going to leave somebody out. Um, um, can't even think, think of editors. I always, you know, it's I, I tend to get along very well with editors that other people can't stand. So it's uh, like uh, I always used to hear lots of complaints about Don Daly. No offense, Don, but I always got along great with Don Daly. Um, let me think who else. Um, Jonathan Peterson was I always had a lot of fun with. Um, trying to think. Um, 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 God, what was his name? Jason Liebig, who who was on uh, the Counter X books at uh, at Marvel when I was doing uh, X Man, another X. Uh, that way, you know, I always got along great with Jason. Um, I generally don't, you know, honestly, it's very rarely that I have any problems with editors. Yeah. Um, okay. Un- unless there's just severe disagreements about direction of the book or something like that. Um, so. You know, I, yeah, I mean, those those are top ones, and I, I'm just having trouble thinking of other ones that, that off the top of my head. Cause, All right, well, you know, it's the, the people that I, I work with now that are in my, I mean, it's like, you know, I don't even remember stories that I wrote five years ago, let alone editors. So, <laughs> oh, Well, then you won't like this question. So, okay. <laughs> last question, I promise. But I wondered, uh, of all the comics you've written since 1978, now we have a, we can we can pin it there. So it's 37 years, uh, give or take a few days. Um, is there one comic that you wish you could put back in the bottle and never be seen again? Oh God, there's dozens of them. <laughs> I mean, there were a million. Um... There were a million uh, filling issues of crap for Marvel that I did. Um, I mean, there there was. I mean, like I, I one of the first jobs I ever did at Marvel was this wrap up of the of Omega the Unknown, the character that Steve Gerber had created. Because when Steve was writing Defenders and they canceled Omega, in he was writing the letter page and said, "We'll wrap up the story in a future issue of Omega." And I mean, in a few future issue of Defenders, but then he left Defenders as well during the whole uh, Howard the Duck blow up. And then when I got there, Al Milgram was who had become editor of Defenders and all they were getting was letters. 
When are you going to finish Omega? 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 And Ed Hannigan, who was writing at the time, wanted nothing to do with it. So, so um, Al asked me if I would was willing to do it, and you know, I needed money, so I said sure. And uh, anyway, it was probably not the best career move I ever made, but um, well, you know, I tried my best, but I really didn't know what I was doing at the time, and and I, I made a lot of enemies with that thing because it was not the what everyone wanted to see from it. But what everyone wanted to see from it was the obvious ending. So and I didn't want to do the obvious ending. So, uh, cause I figured, you know, Gerber wouldn't do the obvious ending. So Gerber, well, I, Gerber from what I read was not happy with the ending either. Uh, I, you know, I, Steve and I became quite good friends when I moved out cause we were both living in Las Vegas and he never, you know, he didn't really have any huge problem with me doing it. Um, he didn't want Marvel to do an ending, so that that was the what they did didn't really matter to him. Um, and uh, but you know, I mean, there's always lots of uh, you know the trail is littered with stuff you wish you hadn't done, but um, but you know what's done is done and can't be undone, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, you just go on and do do the next thing. You know, you don't really think about the stuff that, that flopped completely. Mm. All right. you know, and, and there, and there, the thing is that there is stuff that I think was terrible that other people just rave about and stuff that I think was great that other people just go, why did you do this? <laughs> so, you know, so on that, in that regard, I mean, things, things that I think a lot of people would expect me to to regret I don't and things that a lot of people I think there are things that people would be surprised that I regret but I but I really don't regret any of it because I'm still here okay. so you know it, it hasn't uh, whatever it was it didn't really hurt me that much in the long run so okay. there is stuff I'd rather people I mean a better question is would be is there anything that that you wish people had paid more attention to and yeah I mean there's a lot of that stuff is um well, I mean, Badlands over the years has gotten a lot of notice. Um, there's uh, Challenges of the Unknown that I did with John Paul Leone and Mike Zach at, uh, at DC in the mid-90s, which had tons going against it, but it was uh, it's some of my favorite stuff. Um, you know, there there's that's the stuff, I that's the old stuff I think about. Uh, the, that's what I regret is that books didn't get more of a shot than they got, which isn't any, you know, I mean, I'm not blaming that on anyone. It's just I wish they had. It, just, it happens that way. Yeah, it, you know, it's just one of those things you have to get used to when you work in this business because it's a, you know, really it's a tough business. So. Oh, tremendous competition and all that. Um, so much product. To yeah, I mean, I was look, I was looking at a list of stuff coming out today, and it's like 60, 70 titles. Yeah, it's like how do they expect to sell? You know, it's just. I don't know, Anna. Most of them aren't even promoted, so how do you uh, expect to uh, uh, you know, tell it, them? You know, it boggles my mind. Uh, two things. One, as a writer of, of books, uh, pe- people say, well, you know, you must be very excited to have a book coming out. And I'm always like, have you been in a bookstore? Do you know how many books are in a bookstore? Do you know how hard it is to get attention? But the flip side of that with the comics is, um, you know, like doing what I do here with Mr. Media, I'm always trying to get uh, the, the comics publishers to, to arrange interviews with creators yeah. because it – I can I can present guys like yourself to a broader audience than the same people who know that every Wednesday there's new comics. Wednesday is but comics. A of, but a lot of comics publishers don't like doing that because they can't control what's going on in the interview, exactly. and that's what they want is to because they don't want him going. You know, they don't want uh, Scott Snyder coming on and talking about whatever class he teaches for two and a half hours and saying, "Oh yeah, and by Batman." They want him talking about Batman through the whole thing. Yeah. You know, so. And, and yeah, and it's very difficult. I, 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 I'm always thinking, hey, don't you want to read it to a broader audience? And they're like, no, don't bother us. We, we like the people we can control, and you know the media that we understand, and go away. So anyway. Well, yeah, but that's you know that's common with everybody. But. Yeah. Well, yeah. listen, uh, folks, you can find collections of Stephen Grant's work on everything from Two Guns and The Punisher and everything in between, including, of course, as we mentioned earlier, the DVD, the Blu-ray to, right. to Two Guns. Right. Buy it. Uh, uh, you can get it. You can get all that stuff in uh, in great stores everywhere, or you can order it right now at a great price at MrMedia.com. Uh, if you if you're watching this interview at MrMedia.com, uh, 
to the left or the right underneath the video you'll see uh, images for the two guns uh, blu-ray and for for comics and badlands and even the csi maybe the csi books that, that steve steven has worked on uh click on it it'll yeah. take, you, take you to amazon you can order it right talking now talking about regrets what? <laughs> talking about regrets oh yeah csi <laughs> oh no no i'm kidding <laughs> All right, we'll we'll let that one slide because we're near the end here. But anyway, you can you can click on those things, order them. I understand Amazon has drones now; they can have you your product in thirty minutes or less in some parts of the United States. And do you know what's funny? I've been joking about that for months since they announced they might do drones, and now uh, in a lot of areas like where I am in Tampa, Tampa Bay, uh, you can actually get your product delivered by nine p.m. This the day you ordered it. It's it's insane. Um, oh, well, I. We we have a fry. You have Fry's Electronics there? No, we don't. Okay, so, uh, Fry's is this huge electronic superstore that's over a lot of the West. And uh, this week in their ad, they had a whole page of drones you can buy for between four hundred and nine hundred dollars. So you know, I thought that was an interesting sign of the times. I and um, I I saw you mention that on, on or someone mentioned it on your Facebook page. Yeah, I, I mentioned thought. it on uh, on Facebook. Yeah. Wow. And see, folks, there's the advantage to to being a Facebook friend of Mr. Grant's. Um, a website for you is it paperfilms.com ah uh, no it's papermovies.com paperfilm jimmy palmiotti's but there's actually nothing on it right now it's it's uh one of those things i have to do is get back to is find the time to design a new website ah all right and uh, we mentioned that you're on facebook are you on twitter as well no, no, just on Facebook. Okay, so people, but I'm on Link- I'm on LinkedIn, but I never go there. I mean, I look I look at LinkedIn like once a week to connect anyone who wants to connect, but, but I never actually go on there and take part in anything. But so Facebook mainly. Yeah. All right, so if you want to follow, if you want to follow Mr. Grant's posts, that's where you go. Uh, anyway, uh, Stephen, you know it was a shot in the dark inviting you to come on. It was a it was a wonderful hour. I think it's been now, and uh, thank you so much for being a guest on Mr. Media. Thank you for having me. That was great fun. So, anytime you want to do it again, let me know. I don't know where the camera is on this thing. Tell me where the camera is. It's, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess it's right, right about, about there. there. Okay, okay, so, so it must, must be right. right. Hi, this is Buzz Burbank in the Buzz Burbank Newsroom preparing for you another Buzz Burbank News and Comment. Do you like good stories? Boy, I sure do. I turn over a lot of stones each day to make sure I don't miss the best ones. Sure, some make me angry and some make me sad and some make me laugh. And isn't that what makes us human? I'm proud of the fact that I pack more news into my 10 or 15 minutes a day than the evening news does in a half hour. It's a free podcast at buzzburbank.com, or you can subscribe free at iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or get it on any RSS device. It's like a newspaper for your head. It's Buzz Burbank News and Comment, another Realm Network presentation. Day mornings right here on the Realm Network. Ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages, welcome to the George and Tony Entertainment Show. Prepare for awesome mediocrity. We're the Cousin Oliver of the Realm Network. I'm George. And I'm Tony. And we're a weekly family-friendly podcast about pop culture. From our point of view. At RealmNetwork.com. The George and Tony Entertainment Show. From the Realm Network. This is Snake. Do you read the Otacon? Loud and clear, Snake. Did you listen to the latest episode of the Gaming Marathon on the Realm Network? Of course. They really know their stuff about gaming, especially that Usid guy. Yeah, but that Chirac guy is a real jerk. I don't like him. Regardless, their reviews are spot on and they tell it like it is. That's for sure. 
what, what, what happened, Snake? Were you spotted? Nah, it's just Lil Melser crying about the O's again. Ah, uh, whew. Close call. I better continue the search for Metal Gear, but keep listening to the gaming marathon each week. You got it, Snake. New every Monday afternoon right here on the Realm Network. It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Hi, this is Mark. And this is Lowell. And if you're fans of Don and Mike, you may know who we are. Our number one interns. You, you've met them on the show. They're the guys that ate all the junk and they were outside with each other holding hands with a sign that said they, they loved each other wearing the dunce caps. And what you may not know is that we started out as fans back in their WAVA days. Hi, Don and Mike. It's Mark and Lowell. Oh, yeah. These are, these are two guys that uh, we once actually called them our protégés, didn't we? And now we have our own show, so we want you to give it a shot. <laughs> Just check us out at the Realm Network, realmnetwork.com, or you can go to markandlowell.com. Resistance is futile. It's the Mark and Lowell Show. Every Tuesday and Thursday evenings right here on the Realm Network. And catch the Poor Premium Show Friday nights.